worth learning and they apply across all kinds of domains and any all kinds of industries and you know and Microsoft has made it so darn easy with F sharp to you know create a project in your solution and get your feet wet in it and, you know it's you got you saw me using system.math.py all the same stuff that you have you know with IO or anything else I mean it's all there available for you to use and so that really kind of lowers your barrier uh, into using a language like F sharp. Let me describe to you a scenario that I've seen before. I didn't know whether F sharp would help at all or not, but we had a problem I was trying to solve where we were having, we were trying to data mine uh, network traces. So we had mega, hundreds of megabytes of network traces. And you know, so we had we had to be able to know how to parse the individual trace line. What we're looking for is higher level patterns. And you know, we, we, we did it. We we ended up using Python for it. But um, you know, we had to gather the data. You know, uh, break it down into constituent parts, and then but then remember the data for each of those network records collected over hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of. Um, Repetitions and looking for patterns, and it was. I mean, we we did it somewhat brute force, but I, in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And I, I had no idea if this that would have helped at all or not. But it, it it was you know it was obviously just lots and lots of data. But I was trying to find I was trying to find a pattern in there. One of um, one of the things that you that you can do. I, I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but F-sharp has a construct called active patterns where it allows you to take some of the syntactic kind of niceness that you saw there with pattern matching mm -hmm. and basically extend that to things that are not just simple, uh, you know, cases of an enumeration mm -hmm. essentially, but that also um, involve some computation. So you can actually use that same very similar looking pattern matching syntax to uh, to um, express you know a a certain you know batch of data being or matching some some named pattern or not so you could have I don't know what the different kinds of patterns you might see in uh, you know a stream of network traffic are but um, you know, let's say we had a, I don't know, what, like a sin flood attack, you know, so you could basically define an active pattern that would look for, you know, a packet and basically say, okay, based on my rules, you know, it's essentially just a function, um, but it either matches or does not match this, you know, whatever rules you define inside. So you have to, you know, at the end of the day, you have to look through the data and say, okay, well, if it's got, you know, this many zeros in a row, then then that matches my rule. But, um, so you can be just as expressive about those kinds of things. I mean, you do have to still write the code, right. but in terms of the high level expressive program flow, it can be a lot cleaner. So you kind of, you kind of thrown an interesting challenge out there because uh, an, an idea that I was having, uh, get, getting back to what we talked about at the very beginning of the meeting, that we, we've got uh, a feed audience now. A gang of a gang of a, do, of a dozen or so are going to be coming back to make this more more relevant to what we all do with our real lives, as well as to make it easier to, to find a way to, to apply all this theoretical knowledge. I'd like to to try to come up with some real world problems, or kind of like real world problems um, that we encounter. Uh, for real, and say, how would we solve these in F sharp? And sort of give those out as projects to do in the months between, and maybe come back next month um, with a solution or, or with an attempt at a solution that we can talk about. What, um, what did we use in the language, or what did we use in, in functional programming technique, or what did we not use um, to come up with a solution? Um, and you, you know, your problem might be one that we could, we could tackle, or if anybody else has anything else they want to suggest, we, we could. And we wouldn't all have to do it, but we, we, we could put it out there and say anybody who wanted to work on it alone or wanted to work on it in collaboration with somebody else, you know, we could just do it informally by email or, uh, or maybe you can come up 
something more formal than that to, to communicate, but uh, you know, make that sort of be the uh, at least a, a, a feature of, of, the, of the SIG as opposed to just having a lecture every, every month, which we've been doing, which, um, you know, is, is uh, nice and nice nice work for uh, me and Mike and anybody else, and we welcome anybody else who wants to give a, come up, give a presentation anytime. Uh, feel free to raise your hand. What would you think of that, Ed? Uh, would, would, would you be willing to share enough about your problem that we could take a stab at, at, at helping to find a way of solving it in FSHAR? I could, but the only problem is, I, is starting next month, I can't make it again on Thursday nights. Uh, well, we could do something about that, too, if you don't like Thursday night. It's not 100% it's not ironclad. Does anybody, does anybody have any issue with, anybody besides Ed have an issue with Thursday night? Okay. Anybody have any other night besides Thursday that they could come on a, on a, is it every Thursday night or just the fourth one? All Thursday nights are bad for you. Yeah. Uh, are, are any other nights bad for you? No. Nope. No other nights bad for you. Um, but, I mean, like, I can have the same for anybody else. You know, I don't necessarily want to switch up <laughs> just for my... Most, most nights for me are okay um, most of the time. Uh, I don't. I don't have a bowling club or anything that I, that I do on a regular basis every week. Uh, I don't know about anyone else. Does anybody else have any other nights in the week that are bad? You don't want to ever have a Tuesday. Have a meeting Tuesday's on? bad. Tuesday's bad. No, Tuesday's kind of bad for us because we have dot net signal on the second Tuesday. So strike Tuesday, Wednesday. Every other Wednesday at the Akron Hackerspace, we invite speakers. So I usually. You know, video those as well. Okay, so that's no good. Yeah. Um, that leaves that leave? Monday and Friday. Yeah. Friday, Everybody's we don't want Friday. Uh, Monday, first night of the week. Monday. Monday art review. Mm -hmm. Get the week off to a good start. We get to get to prepare over the weekend. Uh, <laughs> Mike, are you, what do you think? I got four kids, three of which are in four sports. And, you know, once that kicks up every day, it's equally bad, so. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, do they play nighttime sports? Well, I coach on that, but um, whatever the group decides, I uh, uh, figure baseball? out are arrangements. They, are they playing baseball? Uh, one's playing baseball and soccer. So that could be any night. But, the, the, yeah, don't work it, Don't try to work it around me. Do do it for the greater group. I can make do my best to make arrangements for one yeah, night a month. I say the same thing, too. I don't want you to. Well, if anyone deserves to have it worked around, Ed, because you sent us so many illuminating <laughs> yeah, emails right. and extracurricular things, uh, I, I think you've gone a little step beyond the call of duty, so I, I don't mind picking a better night for you. Um, so why don't we say next month it'll be the fourth, um, the fourth Monday, more or less, what is that? Month is April, and it would be oh, Monday's April the first, so it'd be the twenty second. April twenty second. Sound good? Yeah, cool. All right, it's on. It's on camera. It's on camera. We recorded it. <laughs> Whole world's gonna know. Using It'll be on YouTube. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, so. Getting that out of the way, would you be willing to share your, your, I mean, you don't have to give us your actual data. You don't have to see your network traces themselves if that's, you know, we could use a wire stuff. But we, if you could give us something that, you know, something like that data or, you know, or, or, or instructions for how to generate equivalent data um, and, you know, be open to helping us understand what, what, the, what the problem is that we're solving and maybe give us some idea about how you solved it. Um, we can take a crack at uh, putting together a solution to F-Sharp. Yeah, I mean, I, I know our cup, you know, I, I'm a big believer in asking for uh, forgiveness versus permission. I know, like, if I were to ask the company, hey, can we share those? Yeah, the obvious answer would be no. No one's going to give a rip about, the, you know, the content of these number traces. No one's going to know the significance right. of what's in there. Right. Well, I mean, I, I don't necessarily need to know what all your internal IP addresses are. And <laughs> Names of your servers. Well, I'm just thinking what uh, ports are open and all that. I'm just thinking, you know, that, that, uh, trying to then construct an artificial scenario that is you know, not this. Well, the thing is, if, if, if we're going to look for patterns, we need to have data that's big, 
you know, you have something with enough variation in it that, that patterns can merge, right? Because that, that was your problem. You had this, this large, structured, somewhat structured mass of data, but the, 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 the information you really wanted out of it wasn't explicitly there. You know, well, it, it, was, it, was, it was just hard to, hard to visualize both in the visual perspective, but also just intellectually, what was happening in these traces. Because we have things that were happening, um, you know, obviously time-based, mm -hmm. and there's variable data in this pattern, and we expected to see a pattern, and then there's timestamps to them, and we're trying to we're trying to see our things drifting in that. And one of the things, one of the things we do in parallel with this, but it, but it, it generates such massive data sets as we would try to then transpose it from a textual descriptive dump to a graphical view. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's only graphical views are great when you have small amounts of data, but you start getting you start getting to the point where yeah, it's you know, it's just beyond comprehension. <coughs> it, it's it fails. So we went back to just a textual view of things. But again, we're trying to have the program digest this thing and come back and say, here's what your problem is. You know. Because it would, what would happen is we'd run this trace, and it would only take about, well, depending on which test we do, it would only take anywhere from a few seconds to, you know, a few minutes. But it would, it would take the domain experts four or five hours to digest this stuff and then walk through it looking in our minds, looking for what I call a pattern. Maybe that's not quite the right word, but we're looking for something in you know, we just didn't have the time to, to codify it. Mm -hmm. But again, I kept thinking, man. When, when you say pattern, is it known or not known? Because when you originally said it earlier, I kind of felt like you're doing like exploratory looking at the data. But if you're saying domain experts, they're looking for something kind of specific right. in this data. So you know what the pattern looks like. You're just trying to find it in all this data? Yeah, well. Is that? Trying to, trying to make sense. And we, we had cases for this particular thing where we're sending, this is all, you know, Ethernet-based frames, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it contains a variable list of uh, unions of data and stuff. And sometimes there'd be missing elements, and other times there'd be repetitive duplicate elements. And we're trying to find out, and of course these things could be separated by a few traces, they could be separated, you know, quite a long distance from we're trying to understand what is the relationship and timing between these. You know, is it something that is, you know, is it is a, a peak frequency type of thing? And you know, it, it's it's not it's not obvious. It's not it's never obvious. So it takes us a while to sit back and, and look at this and look at this. Sometimes draw timing diagrams and kind of go, oh, I think I see what happened here. I don't know. It's just. Saying and throwing it out is just something that was very data centric. There's no no real no classes, no algorithms. It was just like here's a mass of here's a hundred megabytes of data, <laughs> you know? and then you know raw data. Then you got parts. Then you get then you transpose to something readable. Uh, and an Excel spreadsheet's about 500 columns wide. So I was going to ask you how wide is it really? Like 500 columns, or I mean, how much? Oh. What, how big is a record? How many fields? Um, how many significant and how many that matter? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing too. You, we, you could boil it down to, I don't know, realistically maybe 40, 50. Okay. And, and, and you're looking at specific one, trying to measure certain columns or try to find correlations? Correlations from rows. Uh, each, rows. Each, each row would be one network trace, one, one Ethernet frame. And in that frame is all kinds of variable data. And then, um, there's repetitions of that data over and over and over again, and there's time elements. All this stuff is time stamped, and again, it's just another, another element in the record of time stamp. And so are you trying to measure something between, like a delta between the different frames? And deltas, um, variations in the delta, um, mm -hmm. the the presence, absence, or duplication of data elements. And, and then, you know, so I mean, that, that by itself wasn't, I mean, that was hard enough as it is, but 
But then once we detected the pattern, then it, then it got back into the real domain, the issue of, okay, why is our hardware doing this? You know, what could cause this, what could cause this pattern to arise? But, but we had to get to the point where we can see what the pattern was before we could then st step back and, you know, trying to figure out just, you know, what could it be, you know, that, that generated this pattern. That sounds like fun. It does. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I was like, okay, yeah. this is meaty. Yeah, at least, at least yeah. There's meaty. a there's a lot to do there. But you solved it though, right? I mean, and you actually ultimately found the information you needed, so we can we actually have quote unquote a test, you know, to you know we can judge whether what we've done is accurate. So I have a test. Not really. Not, not something that that's repeatable in a regression okay. manner. But but, it, you, but I mean, you we can take the done, Python right? program and the F sharp program and run them and see if you get similar results or whatever, right? If we did this. Well, I mean, currently what we wrote, we wrote some Python code that would uh, transpose the record from its raw format into a breakdown of the significant elements, you know, the elements that we're concerned about, and we discarded the ones we, we weren't, and then then it started to try to look for repetitions in the pattern and would display it to us. Then the, the real domain expert, myself and another guy, would sit and look at that and try to take it to the next level of, of analysis. Yeah. It, how is the data formatted? Is it like delimited in some fashion or is it like a fixed was it, thing? Or? or is it completely unstructured? Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's definitely not unstructured. Okay. It's, um, so, 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 you, so, so your Python program took the raw data, which is the trace that came out of your network hardware, and which I assume you took in as a text file. Actually, no raw Wireshark traces. Oh, okay, so actually, actual actual data is coming in as a stream over Wireshark into, yeah, into and, the program. And that pa that pattern is well known. It's easy, it's easily to parse it. You, you, we know what the two point three frames are. We know what the Subsequent layers are. Okay. You know, that, that, that part of it is, is straightforward enough. Okay, but we, I mean, we could simulate that by using a text file. Just, mm -hmm. just of course. Well, in files. fact, in fact, the guy who wrote the Python code preferred to have it in text, so he just did sure. a. If you ever use Wireshark at all, through yep. the cool program. You ever, you yep. ever use Wireshark yep. at all? I was I mean, going to say. Amazed. You, in your office environment, if you ever turned it on, and look, you'd be, you, you couldn't believe the amount of traffic from all these different things. You, you probably found Apple Talk printers talking to them. A lot of stuff. But anyway, um, well, let's, let's, let's stop right there. What if, what if we just said let's let's go home and let's all get wires and Wireshark is open source. <laughs> yes. So let's yeah. let's, you know, let's, let's let's all get ourselves a copy of Wireshark. Start running it on our computer, on um, whatever network we have to be on at home or at okay. work or wherever, and just just collect these traces. And uh, well, it's really an eye opener to see. And then you know, start and start there. playing with them. Start start writing some code and just to say you know do something creative with these traces. Um, and you you know use so, so what I was gonna say is that, so it sounded like the first step was just take take the format that you're getting from your tracer, and and do some initial mapping into a data structure that eliminates all the non-relevant parts of it and maybe. Changes how it's encoded, some 